part of a campaign of violence targeting communities in southern Kaduna, which has been ongoing since January 2020. At least 27 people were killed within a 24-hour period between 19 and 20th of July in attacks by armed assailants of Fulani ethnicity on communities in southern Kaduna State. End of quote. That is a report from a particular religious group. So it shows the kind of coloration the crisis in southern Kaduna, you know, has taken. So many of them. A statement by President Muhammad Buhari's media aide, Garba Shehu, about three weeks ago, uh, to be precise, July 21st, uh, came out condemning the attacks. Uh, it was made known to the public and he said the statement reads, Problem in southern Kaduna is an evil combination. Is an evil combination of politically motivated banditry, revenge, killings, and mutual violence by criminal gangs acting on ethnic and religious grounds. So you see what I'm saying now? So many angles. Let's get down to business this morning. And uh, let me bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Abadai Melafia from our Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Nigeria. He's also an astute politician. He joins me, a stakeholder from Southern Kaduna. He joins me this morning uh, on Skype. Uh, Dr. Abadai, a very lovely morning to you. Oh, hello. Good morning to our listeners. And good morning to you. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. It's good to have you, sir. Let's let's get down to business, really. Um, can, can you give us a brief uh, chronicle of how it all started in Southern Kaduna? You are a stakeholder there. Uh, just a brief chronicling of how the entire thing started, the crisis in Southern Kaduna. Well, well, thank you so very much again. Let me just set my cards on the table. Um, I was born uh, in a small, beautiful village called Randa. It's a mission settlement, uh, ancient village in southern Kaduna, in Sangha local government, to be precise. It lies at the tip end um, of the state. You know, the state is very elongated. Mm. And we are very tip end and, um, be and saddles between... Um, Nasarawa and Plateau State were very right on the border. But actually, I didn't grow up there. I didn't grow up there. I, I grew up in Nasarawa State because mm. my father was a missionary, a pastor, an evangelist. Right. Uh, he traveled quite a lot and ended up settling there. So I didn't really grow up at home, I put it that way. That's number one. So that, that gives me some kind of emotional detachment mm. to be able to see things clearly and objectively mm. yes i'm from there uh by origin but i didn't really grow up there number two uh part of my family are muslims okay uncles uncles aunties you know in fact the king of our area in a predominantly 99 percent christian area is, mm. is a muslim mm. and he's mm. my, my auntie the first cousin of my mother and I regard them as family, so I can't afford to play the Islamophobia card. Yeah, exactly. That is really good for me. Mm. So having clear that, it gives me a objective perspective from which to analyze what is happening. Mm. The immediate crisis has been going on for the last two years. The opening salvo was the killing of the Adara king in 2018. Mm. Uh, there had been some killings in his kingdom and around Kachia area. And, you know, tensions had been rising. So the governor, he saw audience with the governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasr Arafai. Right. He went there to see him. They had a good meeting, presumably. And on his way back, together with his wife and driver, they were waylaid on the highway where they were all abducted. Mm. The, um, the driver was allowed to go. The bandits raped his wife. Oh my. The wife, Majesty the King, they raped her in front of him before setting her off. Hmm. And after collecting a ransom of about 10 million on the promise that they were going to release him, right. he was 
He was brutally assassinated. Hmm. It did not stop there. When the elders of Adara land demonstrated, the police came, rounded them up, and put them in prison for about a year with no real charges or trials against them. Hmm. They were eventually released. Meanwhile, attacks were incessant. They were continuous. It was a case of continuous pounding hmm. of an unarmed and defenseless people. Uh, and it has continued to spread from Adara land to other villages uh, uh, and homesteads, uh, Manchok, uh, Kagoro, very recently, Kurmin Masara, Takwai Isa, Ataka Mawe, Fadang Atakar, hmm. uh, Laduga, Zangon Kataf, Magama, Zamando, the list goes on and on. Hmm. The figures are not reliable, but it is clear that we are talking of a very serious and well-calculated and well-strategized, uh, you know, killings. What, what caused these killings, Dr. Obadiah? That amount, that amount to genocide. What, what could have caused this? What could have caused these particular um, uh, um, killings that you've, you've um, enumerated? What, what is the cost? Do you have an idea? Well, again, let me just also clear one fact, that in the 80s and 90s, you asked me for the immediate causes, which I, I the immediate, you know, process of, of killings, which I explained, but it goes as far back as the 80s and 90s. You may have heard of the infamous Zangon cut of killings. That's right. In which the settlers, Zango means an, a settlement. Hmm. And ancient times, the house of people who were itinerant traders used to pass through there, they would settle there and, you know, uh, water their camels and their and their donkeys, and then proceed on whatever journeys they were going to, and then eventually became a kind of more permanent settlement for the Hausa Fulani community. Mm. Hence, it is called Zangon Kataf, in Kataf land. Then they began to demand control of the market, and even demand to have their own chief. And of course, which was not acceptable to the people, and it eventually led to the infamous Qatar riots and killings, which were mutually um, violent, okay. uh, if I may put it that way. Okay. And I can tell you this because I heard directly from him himself, General Zamani Lekwot, very distinguished military officer, retired from the Nigerian army, former governor of River State, and ambassador to Senegal. He, together with another very patriotic colonel, Colonel Johanna Madeki, they went to the police to report what was going on and to seek for help. Hmm. And you will not believe it. The police detained both of them. Oh, my. Yes. Now, General Zamani Lekwot is a highly principled officer, very patriotic. As a young officer, he distinguished himself during the Nigeria Biafra War. Mm. And somehow he was not in the good books of General Ibrahim Babangida because he used to tell him, tell him to his face what he felt was wrong with his policies. Mm. So they were waiting for an alibi and they got it in the Zangon Katavrayot. So they arrested him, detained him, uh, created a kangaroo court, court martial, uh, kangaroo court, and tried him. Uh, in the end, even the judge said that his hands were tied, as it were. Mm. They convicted him and sentenced him to death. General Zamani Lekot has explained to me himself what they did to him, the torture, the agony. Mm. That for two weeks, they took him to the section where people are condemned and ready to be killed. Oh, wow. They put him to the, next to the exec execution chamber. Early in the morning, they wake him up and say, let him have his last breakfast. 
They will open the execution chamber as if they are taking him there mm. and then they will close it again. They kept doing that for two weeks. Most people would have run insane. Mm. But he is a strong man. He became toughened psychologically, endured it until the outcry of the public dissuaded uh, the Babangida administration from committing murder. So, Zambon Katab, and in the 90s, they came to my local government, which is uh, Sangha local government, during all this Sharia palava. Okay. And uh, they brought a huge amount of money to the local house chief and told him that his duty was to enforce Sharia in Sangha land. Who are the day, the area that Dr. Badaya? The military administration of that time, together with some foreign jihadist interests, hmm. they accumulated huge amounts of money in Gwentu. Please take this record very, it is extremely important. Yeah. So, a young man whose elder brother was a pastor in the area went to see the local chief to plead with him not to try this sort of thing in an area that is 99.9% Christian. Immediately he entered the, uh, the palace of the Hausa chief. They brought out a dagger and beheaded him. Oh my word. In the morning, the brother who was the pastor in the area waited for some time. He didn't see his brother. He, said, ah, he told me he was going here. I have not seen him. So he decided to take a walk as he was opening the gate and saying, Assalamu alaikum. He walked in, they just took a sword and beheaded him as well. So in the space of two, three hours, they beheaded two brothers, two blood brothers. When the news spread, it was around during this farming season. Okay. There is a horn, there is a horn that our people use only during the time of war. One of the elders blew that horn. Everybody left his farm. They descended in Guantu. Mm. And the mayhem was uncontrollable. The police only came later to save the day. The local house of Fulani Muslim chief, whose younger wife is actually my first cousin, hmm. my first cousin, they managed to escape. And they have never been back there ever since, since the 1990s. Hmm. So I'm explaining to you the unfolding scenario. So tensions have been building over a long period of time. This is what has brought us to the current denoma, to the current tragedy of very terrible uh, proportions mm. if, if you're just joining us uh this morning you're welcome it's a morning cross fire we have dr obadiah may live here uh from our deputy governor central bank of nigeria uh he's from southern kaduna he joins me on the show this morning via skype you can watch live on facebook and youtube we're trying to look at the trajectory of violence in southern kaduna to this very moment to, to to be able to find a lasting solution to the incident killings um, that have ravaged that particular region uh, of the country for a very long time right now. Feel free to join the conversation. Uh, you can drop your comments below the live video stream on YouTube and Facebook. It's just search for Nigeria Info 99.3. Uh, that's right, Nigeria Info 99.3. Search for it. You'll be able to see the video. Uh, the logo for Nigeria Info is NI. Um, just search where you see us there. You can also tweet us at Nigeria Info FM on Twitter, hashtag Morning Crossfire. Very important, you add the hashtag there, hashtag Morning Crossfire. Um, and we'll be, we'll be able to take your message. Feel free to also send us your WhatsApp message. The WhatsApp number is 0809 597 5805. That is 0809 597 5805. Uh, Dr. Melafia, let, let me let me take your thought. I mean, I am glad that you've tried to chronicle the 
issues from the 90s to this very moment, which has given us some level of um, uh, perspective to what uh, has been going on in that um, geopolitical zone of Kaduna State. Um, the aide to the president said something in his statement in July, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he said that the violence in southern Kaduna is an evil combination of politically motivated banditry, revenge killings, and mutual violence. Do, do you have any any exception to to these three that he, he, he put together? Actually, um, this is very unfortunate coming from a presidential spokesperson. He has shown himself to be ignorant uh, and to be grossly insensitive. When he said politically motivated banditry, could he explain what he meant? He never really explained what that means. Revenge killings. Who is revenging what killing and when? And then mutual violence. Mutual violence itself is a symptom of other things. So I think that response says more about the spokesman hmm. rather than actually about the people of Southern Kaduna. Uh, okay, fine. Let us say it is politically motivated boundary, boundary, revenge killing, mutual violence. So what have you done about it? Does that in a way um, explain it away? Does it justify it? Does it make it acceptable? So after saying all of that, hmm. what next? What has the government do? See, <laughs> Don't forget, the governor of Kaduna State and the person of Malin Nasr Erufai, Ahmed Erufai, actually some few years ago mm. confessed openly that, uh, you know, the killings were politically motivated because of attacks during the 2015 elections and that they had traveled to Mali, Chad, Niger to find out the ringleaders of those who had killed the people of Southern Kaduna mm. and paid them money from our national, from our state treasury so as to uh, appease them so that they would not come back and continue the killings. He did not disclose how much. He did not disclose who those people were. So if we knew who these people are, and the reasons why they killed, why haven't we come out openly to, dis dis to identify who these people are? Mm. Let, Let me tell you something. Yes, please. That people would not know. The northern establishment have a special, and I would say special, hatred reserved for three sets of people. Southern Kaduna, Plateau and Benue. They would prefer anybody anywhere in the world except from those three. When, when you say when, when you say the northern establishment, are you talking about the Muslims in the north? You know, I have tried to avoid the issue of Muslim Christian. It is not that the northern power establishment know who they are. They are not necessarily even Muslims, because oh. good Muslims would, wouldn't be doing what they are doing. They are just a set of murderers, fraudsters, and criminal gangsters that are occupying political offices. This is what they are. So what, what is their aim? What is, what is the end game? What, what are they a aiming to achieve? You, I think you allow me to talk. If you permit me to talk, I will talk. Okay, please, go on. They have special hatred for Southern Kaduna people, a special hatred for Plateau people, and a special hatred for Benue people. And the reason is historical. These sets of people were never defeated during the Fulani Jihad of the early 19th century. They are who they are because they were never conquered. So what the Fulanis were doing was to use the region for slave raids. Mm. They will come at night, they will come at dawn, come 
Nunde, they were areas for slaves. But our people, but our people staunchly resisted them. And they never had a head. This is why they are who they are today. Then they were trading and all sorts of things. So if you ask me really, the reasons for the current crisis, what is leading us to today right. is historical, slavery, the fuller energy had. It is also sociological. Uh -huh. Our cultures are totally different from theirs, totally different from theirs. We are predominantly Christian. There are some enemies among us. They make up at least over 95% of the population of the area. Okay. Then there's the reality of global jihad. That is why I think it is an insult to our people who talk about farmer herders clashes. Those who use that kind of language are accessories to genocide. Hmm. Because it is nothing like farmer herders clashes. Look, the Fulanis living in our community speak our langu local languages. Hmm. There are intermarriages among them. Okay. So it is not I even mean, to talk of farmer herders clashes an insult. What is happening is continuation of jihad. This time on a globalized scale, the aim is to to demoralize the people, to wipe them up, to dispossess them of their ancient patrimony, to take over the land, and to impose political hegemony. Let me tell you, there's an area called Laduga. Okay. That area is bigger than Abuja. Mm. For more than a decade now, they've driven the indigents from that area. It's around Kachia area. They've taken over the area and they've turned it into a vast grazing reserve. Our people are not allowed near there. They have their own emir, they have their own chiefdom, out of nowhere. When in fact, Zazo Emirate starts from Jaji. Because Kaduna belongs to the Baji people. Every historian knows this. It is not Fulani territory. Mm. That is why we have no emir of Kaduna. But we have a chief of Kaduna who's an indigent. And because he's an indigent, they have refused to give him first class status. He's just a common chief somewhere unknown by people. Mm. So what is happening today right. is a jihad. It's a jihad. It's a struggle to take over our land. It turned the whole of southern Kaduna into a vast grazing reserve reserved for Fulanis. Hmm. This is the end. This is the this is the game plan. That's a game on. plan. Dr. Melafia, yeah, let me come to you right now. Let's talk about today. There is a curfew in Southern Kaduna. Uh killings are still ongoing. What are your thoughts as regards this, Dr. Melafia? <laughs> it's very, very clear, sir. The strategy generally is that they declare a curfew. Then everybody stays at home. The army goes in there and mop up any bows and arrows and dengons that the local communities have to defend themselves. Immediately they are leaving. You hear gunshots. The jihadists come in, killing, raping, maiming. That has been the approach. Even during the lockdown under coronavirus, this is really what was going on. So I think General T. White Njuma has a point. And I can tell you, the late General Luka Yusuf, of blessed memory, former chief of Pakistan, he had reason to call one of his successors, an army chief of staff, he called him and almost slapped him. He told him, I wore this uniform before you. Hmm. I know what you are doing. You are the one giving uniforms and boots to these killers to come and kill my people. If you don't stop it, now me and you. Hmm. 
And during that, I can tell you, I won't, for legal reasons, I won't right. name the name. Right. The people are sitting right. around. Right. Right. They know them. Right. They know themselves. Then it stopped. The nonsense stopped. But look, let me take point by point because there's a lot of ignorance going on. Malam mm. Usman, look, fighting went on and there was a lot of fighting and youth blockaded the roads and did some nasty things. We don't approve of that. But if it is true, it is a Muslim attack, attack on Muslims. What has that got to do with land? What has that got to do with land? Why don't you leave it on the sphere of just religious killings and so on? Why do you want our land? Why? Does it occur to you that anywhere you people settle, the place becomes a desert? I don't know whether you understand that. Anywhere you settle, that place becomes a desert. Look at history and look at geography of the world. Anywhere these people settle, the place becomes a desert. It becomes cursed without blessing. That's why you want other people's land. Please go back to your desert and leave my people alone. Please. Two. Ade talks about judgment. I agree with you. Judgment is coming. Because you cannot disembowel pregnant, expectant mothers. You cannot kill innocent children and elders. And their blood touches the ground. And God will not judge. Judgment is coming. Those people who have done this wickedness will carry their own shit with their own hands. Excuse, mm. excuse my language. It's all right. The time is the time is coming. Mark my words. Obadiah is a minor prophet in the Jewish Old Testament. So mark my words. Judgment is coming. There will be the judgment of God, the judgment of history the judgment of posterity, and the judgment of humanity. Obi, look, I've heard this thing, Obi, from Ejibo. I have Indigo friends, very dear friends. Yesterday, this weekend, Ohaneze Indigo leaders and Afenifere leaders and Pandev leaders from Niger Delta were all in southern Kaduna on a fact-finding mission. Mm. The peoples of the Middle Belt of southern Kaduna, we have a newfound solidarity with the south. Our destiny does not belong in the north. We are no more northerners, and we shall never be northerners. We shall either stand on our own or join the south. Mark my words. Mark my words. But, Paul, Obi, you are very wrong. What happened in the 60s? You cannot equated what happened today and in fact in the what people are saying is that, is that it is a kind of nemesis my father i told you it was a, a reverend a missionary a right. pastor right i remember as a child he did so much to protect Igbo families so many of them settled in my home as refugees, even on our farms. Mm. He did everything to protect them, to feed them, until they nearly killed him and killed all his family for protecting Indigo. Mm. So it is not everybody that took part in that wicked enterprise, in that pogrom against the defenseless Indigo people. And I've always said it, this country will never be normal. Until we kneel down and ask for forgiveness from indeed, but from the wicked sins we've committed against them. I wrote that severally. Some people from Yoruba land called me and said, Ah, but there, if you know you've done something to Indigo, go and re repent. We didn't do anything to them, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. That is the attitude of many people in the country. But you cannot equate the two. So, because genocide took place in Turkey during the Ottoman Empire, because lynching took place in America, so we, the grand people that sent the slaves there, where if something happens to us, we are equally guilty, so it is okay. Obi, mark my words. When the finish was all, they will come to you. Don't think you are free. Wake up and smell the coffee. As for Mr. Paul, the role of the police, security, and stuff, look, we have reason to believe that the full apparatus of the military is behind the banditry and violence because it is a global jihad. They are financing them. They are giving them uniforms. They are disarming our people. 
and allowing them to come and kill and rape and maim. So Lieutenant General T.Y. Teofilis Yakubu Denjuma is perfectly right. And let me make it very clear. Even my name, hmm. Obadiah in Jewish Old Testament means servant of the Most High God. Melafia means a man of peace. So I am by destiny the servant of God, servant of the people, and the man of peace. I abhor violence. If you could see my hands, I have never lifted my hands to commit violence, either in word or speech or action. I belong to the Martin Luther King School of Thought. But let me make it very clear. Our constitution protects the right to life. Right. It enshrines the principle of self-defense. So it is true of municipal law as it is of international law. Hmm. International law and the law of nations gives a people who face an existential threat to their very survival the right and, in fact, the bounden moral duty hmm. to defend themselves, to defend their communities, to defend their church, and to defend their, 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 their families. No one can take that right away from them. Universal global ethics also gives communities the right to defend themselves. If the government, if the authorities are either unwilling or unable, or both unable and unwilling, to come to the aid and protection of these people. Which is they it? Which is it for you, Doctor Badaya? Do you think the government is unwilling or unable to protect the people of Southern Kaduna? In fact, it is not only unable; it is unwilling, and we have good reason to feel that they are part and parcel of the killers. Let me make some revelations to you. That's a very big. That's a very big allegation, Doctor Obadiah. The please, government is part please, and parcel of of the killers. Yes, that, that's big. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How will the government just say, "Oh, it is revenge killing" and so on? Then you leave it there. Oh, because it is revenge killing and so on and so forth. The body language of this administration, the body language of the state government, mm. shows clearly that they have a hand in the killings. No doubt about it. Because you see, General Abacha. Hmm. and people don't give him his due do you think you would have tolerated such nonsense General Bacha famously said that if an insurgency lasts for more than two days the government knows that is the real and the truth and let me make some revelations because some of us also have our own intelligence networks okay okay have met with some of the bandits. We have met with some of their high commanders. One or two who have repented. They have sat down with us, not once, not twice. They told us that one of the northern governors is the commander of Boko Haram in Nigeria. Boko Haram and the bandits are one and the same thing. They have a sophisticated network. Mm -hmm. During this lockdown, there are planes were moving up and down as though there was no lockdown. Moving ammunitions, moving logistics, moving money, and distributing them in different parts of the country. They are already in the south, in the rainforest of the south. They are everywhere. They told us that when they finish these rural killings, they will move to phase two. The phase two is they will go into the urban cities going from house to house, killing prominent people. I can tell you, this is the game plan. By 2022, they want to start a civil war in Nigeria. Don't joke with what I'm saying. I have a PhD from Oxford University. I'm a central banker. We don't talk nonsense. So don't joke with what I'm telling you. I have this from the highest possible authority, higher possible, higher authorities of some of the commanders of the killers and Boko Haram. You, you said you said northern governors, past or present, Doctor Badaya. No, current, current, current. 
No, they said one of them is the commander of Boko Haram in Nigeria. One of them. And they are not looking for money. They have more than enough money. In fact, he told me they just came back from from uh, one of the Middle East countries in private jet full of ammunitions and dollars. Did they tell you, Dr. Said, Badaya, why they would want to cause civil war in 2022? Yes, so that they can continue in power. I'm not making this up. I am not joking about this. I love Nigeria. I don't like the shedding of innocent blood. How can we find? I don't want civil war in our country. How can we find a lasting solution to this? How can we stop this from happening? I mean, uh, let's just say hypothetically what you're saying. How how can we bring an end to this? How can we bring peace to Southern Kaduna, Doctor Badaya? Well, the killers should leave our land, and all the lands they've taken over. They should peacefully withdraw, leave our land for us, because this is not our land. You know, Sheikh Hussani, the former senator from my state, he right. said recently that, look, when you look at Kagoro people, I am Ninzam from Sangha local government. If you look, look like a Ninzam man, you look at an Atiaf man, you look at a Kataf man, you look at a Jabba man, he cannot go to Kanu. And this is our friend who calls himself Usman. You say you are from Katsina. Right. None of our people can go to Katina and start fighting over land with you. They cannot go there and start fighting over land with you. Why are you coming to fight with land, or over land with us? We have nowhere else to go. This is our ancestral land. Our people are farmers. They are very poor. The government has neglected them. The government has marginalized them. During the last elections, do you know what they did? They did not register most of our people. And when they did... Even during the voting, they will bring the vote, the voting machines around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Right. When people are tired this morning, lining up, they say there's insecurity, they'll pack and go. They systematically disenfranchised our people. We have been excluded from this government. Hmm. Some of us are comfortable uh, by the grace of God. Right. Alhamdulillah, we're comfortable. I did not steal one naira of government money. Hmm. I've never the state... I have a distinguished international record. Right. So I'm very proud of myself. I will never beg from anybody or from government. Mm. As a matter of fact, I despise them. Their money is cost. Dr. Badaya, thank you. We will have to drop it here because of time. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the Morning Crossfire. It's a pleasure talking to you this morning.